So uh, thanks to the Alliance for inviting me here today. And uh, obviously, I acknowledge the, uh, the Port Madison Enterprises and the sponsor. As I, as I tell the folks I'm around on the base every day, we're not named after a peninsula or a county. Naval Base Kitsap carries the name of a, of a proud, fierce Suquamish uh, leader and warrior. Uh, Naval Base Kitsap, though, is... Thank you. So Naval Base Kitsap is, is essentially the Navy's presence in Kitsap County and on the Kitsap Peninsula. That's five principal locations, Bremerton, Bangor, Keyport, Jackson Park, Manchester. There's unique mission sets that the Navy has chosen to combine here all in one base that we have not done in any other place in the Navy. So I'll give you uh, some unique mission things where we're at with our, our numerous tenant commands here on the base uh, and just kind of the state of the station, if you will, as far as where we're at with Naval Base Kitsap today. Uh, so primarily our mission is to support the missions of those commands that the Navy has chosen to home here in the Pacific Northwest. And it is, it is, a, is a big and diverse list of, of missions that come here, whether it's uh, strategic deterrence on ballistic missile submarines, uh, fast attack submarine missions, research and development at Keyport, uh, maintenance of nuclear powered warships at Puget Sound Naval Shipyard, uh, and all the things in between. Uh, as, as far as the base commander, my job is to facilitate those missions. Um, in some ways, you know, almost in an unelected mayoral sort of way where we provide those facilities to enable those tenants to do it. I don't truly have any true command relationship over them uh, and to direct them in where they come and go and how they do that mission, but it's my job to support those. And my primary focus there as the, as the installation commanding officer is to look out for their safety and security first and foremost, to enable those missions and to ensure that we protect our environment while doing so. Uh, we provide uh, critical utilities, comms, environmental services, fuel to Navy ships, quality of life services for service members, uh, civilian employees, and their families that are stationed here in the Pacific Northwest. As I alluded to before, we're really five installations uh, here on, on, on the Kitsap Peninsula. They're all combined under Naval Base Kitsap about 20 years ago, 2004. Um, so it, it winds up being roughly the fourth largest fleet concentration area in the Navy when you put all that together. But I would argue it's the most complex multi-mission installation in the entire Navy as, as far as the missions that happen here. Uh, I highlighted some of those between the focus for submarines in Bangor, uh, an aircraft carrier home port in Bremerton, uh, and, the, and the home of Puget Sound Naval Shipyard, which is just a year or two older than the city of Bremerton itself, where we do that shipyard for repair work on Navy vessels. Keyport, where we work on torpedoes and underwater, un, underwater vehicles, a lot of work there in the unmanned arena. Uh, to that, uh, to the, you know, the previous discussion about the sectors that are involved in that. Uh, fuel supply out of Manchester, a large fuel supply down there. I recently have been given responsibility for the day-to-day -day operation of, of management of that facility as the Navy works to align the command structure over that. And then Naval Base Kitsap at Jackson Park, you know, the uh, Navy uh, Medical Readiness and Training Center there, uh, child care, military housing. So a lot of those things and all those, all those installations carry affiliated services such as food, retail, childcare, entertainment, uh, leisure activities, police and fire services on the federal side. So it does act like a small city uh, where folks could live and work. This gives you a profile of where we are. Uh, you know, Naval Base Kitsap is homed in the Navy divides the country, really the globe into specific regions. I work under the authority of Navy Region Northwest. Uh, Admiral Mark Sicado is my, bo my boss in that way. Uh, he has a very large region from Alaska all the way over to Minnesota and down into just uh, uh, really a few portions of Northern California that he has oversight of. Uh, in the local area here, there are four other specific installations. There's Naval Magazine Indian Island is separate from Naval Base Kitsap. There's Naval Air Station Whidbey Island up in the San Juans and then Naval Station Everett uh, in Everett, Washington. And Naval Base Kitsap, really from that view winds up being somewhere between 60 to 75 percent of the region so there's a lot of focus on what's going on at mbk uh, in in comparison to some of those other installations that i named uh, over 80 tenant commands when i say tenant command that's a that's a you know a navy command that has its own commanding officer that is here to do their job that is on naval base kitsap um, makes about fifty-two thousand people working on the base in, in around the day so uh 
as far as the, the who's commuting from where, I'm going to have to go back and take a look at that one. Uh, 1,800 buildings, numerous in-water structures, uh, critical large portfolio of shore infrastructure that plant replacement value is significant. You would really have to combine San Diego Naval Base, Norfolk Naval Shipyard, and the submarine base in Kings Bay, Georgia to equal Naval Base Kitsap and sort of the missions and that investment and what goes on here. We support 65% of the Navy's strategic deterrent here and the Navy carries a large portion of the strategic deterrent mission for the nation at large, which that's a mission shared with the US Air Force. Uh, obviously we do that much better. <laughs> Laughter as appropriate, I appreciate it. Um, and that doesn't really reflect more than a $7 billion investment in the future of a replacement for the Ohio class submarine, the USS District of Columbia. We shorten that to the Columbia class. Uh, although in true Navy fashion, we also have an active USS Columbia that's named after a city uh, that will no less be confusing, I'm sure, in the coming years. Uh, and then once in a, really once in a century invest in investment in the shipyard infrastructure optimization program. I think most of you in the audience know that by PSYOP shorthand uh, to include a lot of things to bring uh, Puget Sound Naval Shipyard up, up to some modern infrastructure. As I said, it's only a year or two older than the city of Bremerton. So again, a lot of focus at Naval Base Kitsap on the quality of life. I've got more than 1,700 family homes. Um, I, that is not, we do not have enough family homes to home all the families that are assigned here. Uh, almost 4,000 unaccompanied housing units, what we typically refer to as a barracks room for unaccompanied sailors, sailors with no families that live on the base, uh, fitness centers, pools, hotels, museums, uh, eateries, galleys, restaurants, a lot of those things. I've got uh, movie theaters, bowling alley, softball fields, even got a skate park, uh, grocery stores, convenience stores, numerous what we call micro marts, sort of unmanned. We're trying to pull, a, the Navy Exchange is trying to pull a page out of what Amazon does over in the over in the ballparks where you can kind of come in and it's all unmanned. It's all camera system. You can go in uh, great benefit to the sailors and, and employees on the base there to, to do those things. Uh, our child development centers are nationally accredited. We've got about 550 spaces. So as with family housing, I don't have the I don't have the capacity on the base for every active duty member of the Navy that's stationed here that has a school age or younger child to get that child care that goes out into the economy. There's, there's, you know, there's a portion of it that we do ourselves, but by and large, we look to the local economy for a lot of those things when it comes to housing and child care. These numbers, some of you may have seen before, if you've uh, heard me uh, speak at some of these meetings, the, the 52,000 is an updated number. The rest of the economic, economic data here this is a little dated. Um, it actually costs the federal government money to go figure out how much money we put back into the economy. So we haven't invested in that kind of study since 2017. However, we are actively participating with the state of Washington under an effort led by the Lieutenant Governor's Office to forecast the military economic data uh, statewide. And we expect to be able to leverage that with the local impact as the state works on that study. We think we probably, I don't know, Joe, if, uh, Anyone at Kita would challenge us on this, but uh, I'm told we're probably as big as the next 15 employers combined. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, all together, you know, we think of you as 39,000 people employed here. Um, and that dwarfs our, uh, you know, our second largest employer is significant, uh, St. Michael Medical Center, but I believe that's under 20,000 folks. Did I get that right, Chad? Okay. So I'm certain there's a lot of interest in the room on sort of where the Navy's future is with Naval Base Kitsap. And so the first one I would highlight is that uh, you know, we're transitioned from the Nimitz class carrier to the Ford class carrier. Uh, it's a newer ship, it's modernized, it's got different electrical distribution systems, it has different needs, different in infrastructure needs. Um, so today Puget Sound Naval Shipyard is the only place in the Western Pacific theater of, op or in the Pacific theater of operation uh, where we can dry dock a Nimitz class aircraft carrier. And we've got to be able to do that for the Ford class going forward. Uh, Navy's taking a hard look at how and what is the best way to do that. Um, so there are big changes that will impact, impact us on Naval Base Kitsap with the need for those. Uh, that PSYOP that I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, they'll have to plan all those military construction projects. There's 
there's key factors I think you'd be interested in is that Ford is slightly bigger. It can handle more capacity, but it will actually be crewed by slightly fewer people as we modernize these uh, with newer systems, uh, as we spoke to with automation before. The Navy's also able to leverage that in our ship design. Doesn't necessarily mean less people for Naval Base Kitsap um, because as for some period of time, we're going to have to employ a workforce that has expertise in repair work on both classes of vessel. There will be some significant energy changes uh, as far as how that, how the infrastructure that supports the electrical demand on those carriers. As I mentioned with the PSYOP, that's uh, overall that, that umbrella term PSYOP really refers to the Navy's large scale program to modernize all four of the public shipyards. Uh, that's Norfolk Naval, uh, Portsmouth Naval, Pearl Harbor Naval, and Puget Sound Naval Shipyards. Uh, so those proposed upgrades are gonna go after critical deficiencies in our dry dock capacity, capability, seismic survivability, um, and that's gonna enable PSNS and the intermediate maintenance facility there to, to meet that mission of repair work into the foreseeable future. Really haven't seen a major update there for over half a century. Uh, and then we're looking at you know, the, all the other things that have to go into that to support as well as you know, that, that plan that looks at as we do that and we get ready for that new carrier, how do we develop that whole area and look at, make sure we're making smart choices on where to put additional parking, additional support facilities and all that to be planned in to ha house that new class of carrier. And then the other one is the Columbia class submarine. As I mentioned before, uh, USS District of Columbia. So that's going to recapitalize the survivable leg of the nation's nuclear triad. We think the, the lead ship of the class, USS Columbia, will uh, make her first deterrent patrol uh, somewhere in the early 30s. Uh, it would be the largest, most capable, most advanced submarine that the country's ever produced. Um, and it represents a, basically a generational recapitalization. And we meant to take the, that leg of the submarine force out to the 2080s. With that will also come upgrades to the refit facility and the training facility. You know, the, the, the differences in the, in the operating systems, the control systems, those structures between those two flat platforms will matter in the training facilities and those will also have to be upgraded and, and maintained. And again, we will go through a transition period where we have to operate both of those uh, for both classes of ship at the same time. Some other things that we've been up to on uh, other construction projects, uh, you know, as, as we recently uh, celebrated the 50th year anniversary of the Bolt decision uh, and the impact to uh, local activity, both state and federal here, we are doing our part on the Navy to restore fish passage through culverts. Uh, as part of, part of my job here at Naval Base Kitsap, I also, the railroad that runs from the, from the bases here in Bremerton and, and Bangor down to Shelton all of that runs through federal land. The federal government doesn't operate the railroad, the day-to-day -day operations of that, but that is our land and those culverts and those impacted fish passages are, are doing and we're working to get through those. So it's a nine phase project. So over the next eight years, we, we've got 12 different railroad culverts targeted uh, in, that, in that entire stretch of railroad. It's about 77 miles long, also 80 years old uh, and it carries, uh, it, it even carries our waste off the peninsula or through the uh, contractor there. At Manchester, we're doing tank replacement. We're upgrading the perimeter fence. So there's 34 underground tanks that are concrete and steel. Uh, extremely impressive when you go down into those tanks underground to see the, the way those are, are preserved and maintained to, to contain the, all that fuel and uh, do that environmentally safely. But the state of the art is to pull those tanks above ground so that this, it's much better. Uh, for monitoring and environment and those sorts of things. The initial tanks were built in World War II and we'll continue replacing those. We've been working on that replacement for about three years and that's gonna continue out to about 2030 to, to shift to an above ground storage posture. Uh, drinking water, certainly with uh, the PFAS and uh, PFOA discussion at the, at the, on the national stage, the Navy again has been doing our part. Um, you know, a lot of chemicals we developed in the 60s. Uh, I love Gore-Tex. I love Teflon. I like microwave popcorn. I love the, cap I love the capability that a film fighting, an aqueous film forming foam does to help fight a fire. But those chemicals aren't great for us. Uh, and, they're, and, they're, and we've got to go clean that up. So we've been working hard. 
to go out, go out in the community, ask those that are still on drinking water wells to allow us to come in and sample their wells so we can understand where they're where we're at. Um, you know, some of that as a federal entity, we work pretty closely with what the current EPA rules on that. And as those EPA rules get more clarity in the future, we will continue to follow suit as as we go out and and look for where we know that we've contributed to that and do our part to to undo some of that damage and to help folks to cleaner stream and drink drinking water if and where we've uh, found that. Uh, we have not found, I want to say, a handful of wells, very few small numbers of wells that are above the EPA limit um, as we've gone out and done those. And we have quickly gotten those households uh, onto, onto drinking water that does not carry that uh, PFAS contamination. We also, uh, the Navy in the interest of this and, and some of this, uh, you may not be familiar with the Red Hill issues, the Red Hill fuel farm out in the state of Hawaii, um, where some issues in infrastructure there led to contamination of drinking water. So in anticipation of avoiding those issues Navy-wide, the Navy has issued some new rules on how we manage and monitor drinking water at our naval installations more closely. So we are uh, working those oversight on the base uh, here. The, you know, Navy's leaning into that to make sure that we're monitoring those things and make sure that we're not subject to the same vulnerabilities that we found in Hawaii. As I mentioned earlier, we are committed to that environmental stewardship, uh, have to balance the mission environment. Uh, you know, it, it, obviously it's, we want to protect what we have and we want what we have to stay the, in the great shape that it's in. Uh, so we work with the uh, federal partners, state, local agencies, the federally recognized tribes, lots of non-governmental organizations, and all that work helps us uh, sustain both the Navy mission and provoke Navy environmental stewardship programs on land, at sea, throughout the Pacific Northwest. Uh, so as I previously mentioned with the culverts, we're also engaged in a three-year study uh, near the Navy Railroad. So we're in the early stages of those. So we're going to measure the success of what we've done where we have restored that fish passage to be able to look at fish on either side of, of the previous location of those culverts to see what we're doing there, see what we're getting, that, make sure that we're getting the desired outcome out of those. Uh, we have assisted uh, both the Quamish tribe and the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife to uh, keep, keep the Salish Sea Coho population healthy. We facilitate the transfer of fish from the Gorse fishery up to off the docks at uh, Naval Base Keyport, Kitsap Keyport uh, to help get those just over here to the fish pens here at Agate Pass. Um, impressive operation. You see those, those fish come up and get transferred to the barge. And then there's the REPI program, Readiness Environmental Protection Integration. So, and I, a lot of this uh, sort of, by the way, a background I didn't give you at the start. I'm a career submarine officer by trade. Um, I grew up learning how to operate a nuclear reactor plant safely, how to use that motor propulsion to move the submarine through the water, how to stand that watch, how to drive that ship, uh, how to, how to, engage our nation's enemies from that ship, all those things. I'm an operator. That's, that's where I grew up. And at the 25 year point, they're like, here, go do this base thing. <laughs> I'm not a civil engineer. I'm not a construction battalion guy. I've got no background in this. So I learned all these amazing things. And one of the things that I, I thought is really awesome that we're able to do is in the interest of saying, I need to put a foot down or put a, put a protective web over. I don't want to put a foot down on the environment. Probably a bad choice of words put a protective web over some portions of the environment because if that was if that was developed further that would have an impact to the navy mission so i can leverage the navy's mission needs to protect impacts to the environment and the repi program is one of the things that helps me do that uh, we partner with great peninsula conservancy uh, you know misery point is the picture here so that's down near seabeck uh, you know lots of lots of partners that went in on with us but primarily great peninsula conservancy um, we see that as a win because it's, uh, you know, we get, we get that beautiful conserved property that folks can go out and see nature and see wildlife, uh, that light footprint, and it protects the Navy from, from encroachment there. We mentioned local schools. Obviously, as the federal government has activity here, we have to account for our impact on the local economy. Uh, this is a, a graph that will show you, or a chart that will show you where we've got different schools and which districts, uh, that student-connected population. So it's, it's roughly about 3,800 K-12 military children uh, based on our numbers from the 2023 20, school year. Uh, 
and then we do also we send out letters to our families every year to participate in those surveys to help ensure that the federal dollars to support the education system here is truly representative of uh, our impact on the schools here based on the active duty members that are stationed here and their children. Uh, one last slide here on community and Navy partnerships. Uh, so let's just go around the slide. We participated in the joint land use study that was a collaborative effort between the installation and local governments here to encourage compatible activities near the installation. Again, when you look at the commuting problem, how do we get people into and off the base with the least impact possible in the community? Uh, again, that's part of what goes into the joint compatibility transportation plan that we engaged in with the city of Bremerton uh, to look at those so that we can that we can continue to grow together as as Bremerton and, uh, and Puget Sound Naval Shipyard and Naval Base Kits have, have done for so many years. Uh, and then some of the countywide partnerships you see in the lower left whether that's the defense community infrastructure program that's where we i can uh, identify local community infrastructure projects which support naval base kitsap and our mission here and i can just tell you that given how widespread the base is that's a pretty easy connection to make to almost any infrastructure project that goes on in the kitsap county to help do that uh, the most recently awarded was the was 10 million dollars to replace the sewer line between banger and keyport to the central kitsap treatment facility uh, we got about $10 million of federal funding to help with that. Uh, we support services, local service out in town. Uh, I, about 327 off-base service calls for fire and emergency services. So we have those mutual aid agreements where it's federal firefighters that are going out in town when the emergency is near our base and it's, it's the federal firefighters that can get there first, they get there first. Uh, and then volunteering, and just my own, these are my own sailors. Uh, I don't have the data on all the other Navy activity in there, but my own sailors alone contributed over 2,200 hours of volunteer work in the community in 2023. And uh, last but not least, I'm also a member of the Gorse Coalition to kind of help the Gorse Coalition understand uh, the impact that Gorse has on military readiness here and the impact of the traffic flow to and from the Gorse community. So with that, I'll uh, leave on the uh, contact information slide if you need anything from us there. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today, give you some insight into where we're at today on the base and where we're going in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Captain.